I'm going to take us away from Great Whites right now and bring you guys up to uh, sort of what's happening in Mozambique, uh, which is where I'm from. My name's Hannah Darren. I'm with an organization called Eyes on the Horizon. Uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what I do and what the organization does and what we've been seeing most recently, specifically in the last year since I began working uh, for Eyes on the Horizon. Um, first of all, I'd like to see how many people have actually been to Mozambique. How many people have seen a shark in Mozambique or a ray? Okay, that's awesome. <laughs> Just thought I'd kind of see where I'm at here. Um, Mozambique, next to our neighbors to South Africa, um, has quite a large population. And it's the 18th poorest country in the world. Um, they live on less than three and a half dollars US dollars a day, and that's less than 1,200 US dollars a year. Keep that number in mind. Um, Mozambique has 2,770 kilometers of coastline, quite a long coastline. Uh, it's a very narrow country. And uh, the FAO <coughs> suggests that one in six Mozambicans are uh, either employed uh, as fishermen or very strongly affected by the fishing industry. Uh, and then the country has 40% of its exports as fish protein. 90% uh, of that is uh, shrimp and prawns. So that's quite a heavy heavy amount for the country and for their uh, GDP. Um, Eight percent, most of that coming from shrimp and prawns, uh, comes from the sea. And then uh, the people of the country eat about 45 percent, um, or their protein comes from fish. Coconuts as well, but mostly fish. Um, there are three different types of fishing industries in Mozambique classify them as the industrial fishery sector, uh, the semi-industrial sector, and the artisanal sector. Um, the industrial sector uh, mostly comes from European uh, companies that buy, uh, buy shares to the fishing rights, uh, and they primarily go for the tuna and the shrimp. And then the semi-industrial, they're primarily around the Sofala Bank area. Uh, those are the smaller fishing uh, motorized vessels, and then we get to the artisanal sector, and that is actually the largest of these three industries. 83% of the, the people who I mentioned who are affected by fishing are uh, within the artisanal fisheries sector. Uh, the boats are quite commonly, they look like this, um, sort of poorly painted, <clears throat> all of them less than 15 meters, most of them fit in between 3 and 6 meters in length, so quite small. And they'll fit um, two to four people on boats that look like this. Yep. Um, it's quite extraordinary, and it's a wonder. Actually, um, quite tragically, not many of them can swim either. So there are actually there's quite a high mortality, and this is a very, uh, very dangerous job for them. But they do it because they get money and they get food as well. <coughs> um, there are quite a few spear fishermen as well, um, and then people that go along uh, beach sailing is also quite popular in the artisanal sector. The artisanal fisheries are uh, most broadly governed by the Ministry of Fisheries, and then within that, there's the IDPPE, and that's sort of the artisanal governance sector. Uh, within that, there are these things called CCPs, which are essentially co-ops. Uh, they're run and organized by a, a village leader, and then everybody buys their shares, uh, buys their their tickets to fish from these guys. Um, so there is a, a pretty strict governance um, as to how people can fish in the artisanal sector. Um, there's the Fisheries Research Group, the IPPE. Uh, they actually do go out and take fishery, um, fish numbers, catch samples, these sorts of things, but uh, their resources are very limited and I've only seen, uh, the year I've been here, I've only seen two people actually recording the fish catches uh, in, in town and in and then there's the School of Fisheries, which trains people up to become these researchers, become government officials, and help uh, organize the country. So you can see there are some shortcomings here. Long coastline, right, 2,700 kilometers. There are only two enforcement patrol vessels for that entire length. Um, one of them was actually an illegal fishing vessel turned, uh, <laughs> turned patrol boat. And we actually recently got the funding to turn it into a super patrol boat. <laughs> Very cool. Um, 
So there certainly are limitations there. And then also, uh, we believe that the, the recordings are very uh, underreported. Um, a study done by UBC Fisheries uh, folks discovered that the FAO reports were about five and a half times lower than what they were actually finding out, um, finding in the country. So not much is being recorded, um, particularly of our charismatic beautiful flora and fauna that we have. Um, turtles, mantas, whale sharks, the bowmouth guitar shark. Um, Mozambique gets a really, really diverse array of animals up there. Um, so this lack of general catch information really hampers what we'd like to do for the conservation efforts for these animals um, and hopefully for the future. Uh, and that's where Eyes on the Horizon comes in. That's the organization I work for. We're hoping to kind of create um, or bridge this information gap and sort of bring information from stakeholders, what we call people who are eyes on the horizon. Uh, and they have information, they're out on the water, they're the dive masters, the dive instructors, the lodge owners, they're the people sipping martinis on the beaches. Um, these are the people that see everything that happens uh, in plain, plain view. And we're hoping that we can get information from them to the researchers and then also to the government as well, so that they can make some, uh, hopefully, some changes. We did this through cost-effective monitoring, uh, citizen science. We get these people to take pictures and record catches and tell us what they're seeing. Um, we give out uh, a pretty comprehensive, easy-to-use incident report form, date, time, exact location, uh, best guesses as to what animals uh, are in the catches, uh, the fishing gear or type that's used, uh, and all the vessels, like I said, they all have um, uh, have licenses, they all have numbers on them, and so we can determine by putting them into a system whether they're fishing legally or illegally. So there's room for all of that in the incident report form. We have a hotline number, that is my phone number. <laughs> no, I'm not single. <laughs> um, but hopefully we're, we'll be able to get people to call us, um, let us know exactly what's happening, specifically if it's really exciting stuff that we need somebody there on the ground at that moment. And then we've also created uh, several different documents to make this easier for people. We've created sort of a vessel um, vessel sheet where you can determine if it's a long liner, long liner a stern trawler, um, a um, purse same fishing boat. Um, so people can take these off as they're going through the incident report form, if they're that dedicated. Uh, and then we're also hoping to make a document that's kind of going on right now by my colleague sitting in the front, front row here, um, on the threatened species that we find, so that people can kind of flip through, and see what they're seeing, and see if it's threatened, um, protected, what have you. Um, so we, we do, of course, have a couple limitations. I'm sure you've already thought of several, uh, mostly we're very uh, in, in, in Inbon, which is the province that we're in, in Inbon centric. We do have some people who report to us from Ponte Doro, Maputo, uh, Ilia de Mozambique here, uh, Nicala, and Pemba. However, um, there's a lot of information that we're getting from Zavara all the way up to the Basarudo archipelago. Um, Tofu is where I'm based, and that's certainly where a lot of our information comes from and goes to as well. Um, Another thing that you may have noticed, you get people sipping martinis um, at restaurants that look populated beaches generally. Um, so we're not actually putting our eyes on these beaches um, that are very remote. For example, this is a picture of Tofino, which is Little Tofu, which is the smaller version of the town that I'm in. And there really aren't that many people that go out on the beaches to look every single day. So there is a limitation as to what we're seeing. Also. Our information is very sporadic. People go on vacations, our most dedicated um, reporters will leave for a couple months, lodges burn down, these sorts of things happen. So our information doesn't come in in a very scientific way. And then also, um, the fishermen know when they're doing something illegal. So that happens under the cover of darkness. So these are things that don't get reported mostly. Um, and I'd actually like to take a second to sort of brush on what's legal and illegal. Um, Mozambique, they do have laws there, despite what some people might think. Marine mammals are all protected, dugongs, whales, dolphins, and then the marine turtles are also protected. Of course, poaching events do happen. 
Um, Mozambique is a signatory to CITES as well as CMS, which could get more exciting in the future as hammerheads and rings got uh, listed. And then there is sport fishing law that does protect great white sharks as well as uh, several uh, bony fish species. Um, so I'd just like to go through a couple of the findings that we have. These are photographic reports that we've gotten from visitors, from tourists, and from lodge owners. Uh, this is particularly just on the threatened um, and endangered animals. So we've seen sandbar shark, snaggletooth. This is the gloom and doom part of my job. Um, quite a few bowmouth guitar sharks. Their, their fins are particularly high grade, and so people really do enjoy catching these. Um, we've seen numbers in the hundreds of the flapnose or cowdose ray, um, including pregnant females. So this is certainly a fishery that is continually going on, particularly in the area of the Lincoulos. Uh, the porcupine ray, leopard whiptail ray, um, these guys again uh, are caught very frequently in our nets as well as on the just the pole casters, and their fins are also highly regarded. And then the endangered scallop, uh, scallop hammerhead. Here's a list of some of the other findings that we've gotten. Um, but I'd like to address some of the, the in interesting animals that particularly you guys are interested in, and that's the, the transborder animals. So these are the ones that have specific management and conservation um, implications. The great white shark, of course everybody loves them here. Um, this one was caught in Coconut Bay April last year. Uh, then we had an alert, um, I actually corresponded with Allison uh, to a research shark that was caught near Kisiko. And I took a team and we went down and we retrieved the satellite tag that was on that shark. Most recently, uh, January this year, we've had uh, this large three, three and a half meter female that was caught in Ginjata and Finn as well. Whale sharks, also trans, um, are, come between the countries, we've seen them caught. Uh, bull sharks, as well as uh, manta rays. So there are certainly implications, not just for Mozambique, but also for South Africa and the entire Indian Ocean, I assume. So we really want to know why as well, so we can kind of mitigate some of these problems. And we interview fishermen, um, and we, we ask questions to try and see where we can help the best. Um, going back in time, uh, Mozambique had a civil war, um, and then in the last 40 years, there was a great migration, essentially, of people who moved from north to south and then from uh, inland to the coast because it was safer there. So you have this essential migration of people to the coastline, and that creates a very intense pressure of fishing uh, that happens there, as well as a lack of knowledge. People who had previously been on the coast had this knowledge of stewardship for their animals, whereas now there are people who are just hungry and just trying to fish and just trying to make money. So there is this um, lack of traditional fishing methods. And shark fishing was never, never on anybody's agenda until, until the 2000s, really. And then, of course, recently we have illegal vessels that are catching the pelagic species that lots of people go for, for, for meat as well as for money. And so this is really bringing down the catch sizes, uh, um, as well as the size of the animals that are caught for the fishermen. And, of course, there's a new lifestyle that people can turn to. There's a very lucrative fin industry, uh, and we have determined that there are fin buyers both in Inyaban, in Maputo, uh, we believe further up north, although, although we haven't confirmed that, and we do believe that they're being shipped internationally. Although there is a large Chinese population, so there is a possibility that those fins aren't actually getting shipped at all, which makes it legal because it stays within the country. Um, to give you an idea of what these fishermen are making, uh, this, these are the fins from the great white that was caught in Gijada in January. Um, the fishermen got about 170 US dollars per kilo. These fins collectively weighed seven kilos, and so that was 1,200 US dollars for these um, probably five fishermen and their families. And so if you remember before I said that $1,200 was about the average income for a family. So these fishermen made their year's income in one day. Um, generally, fins don't usually go for quite that much. This was, I think, a special circumstance because they were great white fins and they were extremely large. Uh, generally, they're sold between 40 and 160 uh, US dollars per kg. 
And then the meat, the meat is actually usually distributed freely amongst the community. I've been offered meat um, myself while taking some photos, and it's only about worth $5, which is quite, quite inexpensive. Uh, another problem right now is that fishermen are realizing that this is very lucrative, so they're changing their fishing methods. They're not using spear fishing and line fishing and near beach seining. They're using gill nets, and gill nets are completely indiscriminate, and so they are catching everything that swims in its path. So from uh, one particular observer, Adam Bow, he's the guy who took the pictures of the great white, who I'm sure some of you have heard his name. Mm -hmm. he, took, um, he took specific numbers of the catches that they were getting, uh, both pelagic fish, reef fish, as well as all the sharks and rays. And he determined that um, it was almost one, one third, one third, one third. So what they're actually trying to catch, or what they used to try and catch, were the pelagic fish. And that was only 30% of the total catch that they got. Sharks and rays made up another 30%, um, and then reef fishes another 30%. So they're really not catching uh, what they had originally, years ago, been trying to catch. So in the future, what we're going to try and do um, is gain more reporting partners, get more eyes on the horizon, really. Um, we're hoping to conduct aerial flights where you can see everything. You can see a turtle shell from the sky. You can see poachers. You can see spear fishermen. You can see every, every net that is set. Um, and with that, we can, we can gain a little bit more knowledge on the density and where the fishing pressure is specifically. Um, we're including the government and the public in what we're doing. Um, we don't want to leave anybody out because it just makes for, for bad feelings on either or both sides. And we really like to cooperate with scientists. Um, ID shots. We have lots of people who are reading our newsletter and going out and then going on ocean safaris. And if they knew a little bit more about how to take proper ID shots of maybe great whites, because we do see them in Tokyo every so often, we'll be able to help with the scientists as well. And then we're also working uh, with an organization called Batonga Divers, and we're trying to train up the next generation so they have a better idea of marine stewardship um, and a better uh, what's the word? love for the ocean, really, is what we want to, to foster um, amongst these people. Because uh, it, we give them the opportunity with Batonga Divers to uh, we take fishermen, sorry, they take fishermen, train them up into dive masters or dive instructors. And that really changes their entire life. And, but it doesn't change them, it changes the people who they influence. So it changes an entire village. So that's a, it's a very powerful next step for us. Um, I'd like to, for you to help me to help you. Um, that was confusing. But uh, if you ever go on vacation up to Mozambique, I highly recommend it. Uh, please send us reports. Um, we like to keep, keep this information going. Um, we do have a monthly newsletter with, with these sorts of reports. And then um, speak to me throughout the conference and let me know if there's anything that my readership or my organization can help do for you. Uh, and then also, of course, um, help us a little bit as well. We'd love to feature research, um, new information that's going out, things that everybody is doing, which is all very exciting. And uh, if you see something, say something. <laughs> so.